I would like to call the February 2nd, 2021 general membership meeting of the Junior League of Baton Rouge to order. I'm Narisha Kurtz Glover, your 2021 league president, and I'm delighted to be here with you this evening. I would like to call up President-elect Tristy Charpentier to lead the league prayer. Please bow your heads for the Junior League prayer. We pray that we may never be so blind that our small world is all we ever see, are so supremely satisfied that what we are is all we ever hope to be. Grant us the joy of filling someone's need, make us gracious followers, make gracious those who lead. And more than all, we pray that down the years, we will remember there are always new frontiers. Amen. We are excited to have you join us for tonight's general membership meeting. This meeting fulfills one of the five meeting credit requirements of membership. To receive your credit, please include your name in the chat function. This is the only way that you will receive meeting credit. In addition, we encourage you to engage and ask questions in the chat function throughout the meeting. Have a great meeting. Narisha. Thank you, Tristy. What a journey we've been on this league year. At the end of 2020, I remember having conversations with my friends about how ready we were for 2021 to arrive. Memes were abound about how 2020 was the worst. But as I stopped to think about it, there were some unexpected opportunities, refocusing of priorities, and many moments of success in 2020 that I'd be remiss not to acknowledge. Because success is a process. During that journey, sometimes there are stones that are thrown at you, and it's up to you to convert them to milestones. Even when we're on a journey, it does not mean that our voyage is without challenges. Between endless digital meetings on Zoom, constantly managing our safety and exposure for ourselves and our family, understaffed or overburdened at work, minimized socialization with friends and family, financial constraints, lives lost, family matters, political divisiveness, even through all of this, it is amazing as women that we've been able to keep it together. And mind you, if you haven't kept it together, that's okay too, because we shouldn't have to always be expected to keep it together. We can just sometimes be happy that we got through the day. One of the unintended consequences of the pandemic is that it has often left us feeling isolated limiting opportunities to discuss personal trials and recognize our progress. We don't have the water cooler camaraderie, evening meetings, drinks after works, birthday and promotion parties that we used to have that would enable us to joyfully celebrate both the big and little wins. It's like the pandemic has limited our ability to celebrate. And so that's what I wanna do this evening. I want to acknowledge some of our accomplishments this year. I wanna recognize you. I wanna celebrate us. I want to toast the league with our sweet treats because frankly, what each of us have been able to accomplish in our volunteer work in spite of this unprecedented year is nothing short of amazing. In fact, it hit me the other day that when other women look back five to 10 years from now, many of us will be seen as innovators. And that was never our intent when we signed on to our roles. The moment simply called us to be, and we stepped up to the plate. And so with that, let's talk about community. It took us 10 years from our gift to Our Lady of the Lake Children's Hospital for it to finally be up and running. We figured out how to divide the work, the appropriate contacts, the new protocol, participated in tours, only to learn that because of the pandemic, volunteers were no longer allowed in the hospital. So now, what do we do with 80 volunteers? You reimagine how you can connect with children, and we did just that by recording more than 40 videos of us reading stories to share with patients and delivering 6,000 craft bags to the hospital. Can you imagine how the 20 minute break for the mom or the caregiver to talk to the doctor, to share some information with family, to check an email, that that was able to happen because of your work, for those families, you're angels. So I wanna say thank you, Brittany Moore and the Patient Activity Days Committee and Heather Folks-Givens and the Resource Center Committee 
for being a blessing to these families. Each year, the Holidays Committee spends 10 months planning and executing our largest fundraiser. They started planning in January 2020. They were forced to pause for three months, and then in four short months, they redesigned a shopping experience, created a shopping website where we had 27,131 visitors, hosted two events offsite, raised a little more than $124,000 for raffle, which is the most amount of money that we've raised for our raffle, and still managed to raise money for auction during the Gaylor when the vendor website crashed worldwide. Aaron Nugent and the Holidays Committee, I do not know how you do it, but job well done. Giving Tuesday. Each year, the league participates in Giving Tuesday by asking our members to support the endowment. This year, we agreed to join other nonprofits in the community to participate in the inaugural 225 Gives. We raised $9,116, the most money we've ever raised on a Giving Tuesday and on the heels of just completing a successful fundraiser. Thank you to all of the members who participated. Okay. Can you imagine being the first event of the league year and having no guidance, no binder for how to implement it because it's the first virtual membership event for the league? That was the task of the new member committee that helped Super Saturday with our first drive through for the league, followed by our first large group Zoom meeting with breakout groups. These advisors welcomed 135 new members and many of the lessons we learned on Zoom started with this committee. They taught us that sometimes the best road is the one you make. So thank you to Juliana Myers, Adrian Quillen, Vivica Johnson, and the new member advisors for paving the way for all of us this year. Every time I see an email from the Sustainable Relations Committee, I just want to dance in my seat. The level of creativity that they have used in implementing not just the sustainer events, but also incorporating the Own the Journey theme has been amazing. They began the sustainer social with a French wine tasting, French music and berets, followed by an olive oil tasting holiday social with red stick spice where they visited Italy. And now they're preparing for a British Sunday tea in a few short weeks. The engagement and the enthusiasm for our sustainers has been overwhelming. And so many kudos are to be had by Olivia Lynn, Elizabeth Lorenz and their committee. Many women join the league because they want to connect with like-minded women. And that work to recruit and then to develop is executed by the membership development committee. They have held a Zoom game night. They have held a Zoom game night scavenger hunt. What items in your home? A Netflix night with a movie holiday. I love because y'all know I love my Hallmark. And a tacky sweater party with treats from Bite and Boards, who's who has so who has so also provided the treats for tonight. They put on those three member events while putting on three virtual recruiting events where we will welcome more than 100 new women into our league family. Thank you, Allison Reeves and the Membership Development Committee. At the beginning of the year, I tasked a training council and committee to further develop our training curriculum by aligning the 29 Association of Junior League International Civic Leadership Competencies. The council met every week for the first month of June, which y'all, if I'm really honest, it concerned me about early burnout of the committee members. But every time I see a list of trainings for the upcoming month in your league lately, and then when you sign on for your trainings and you see the competencies that will be gained, I know that it was well worth it. To date, our members have been offered 33 training opportunities during the day, in the evening, and on the weekend that can be accessed online and at your convenience. The topics and the format are wide ranging and that's intentional because every member's needs are different. This is one of the greatest values you receive of your league dues. So thank you to Monique Scott Spaulding, Dorothy Kemp, Bridget Harding and the training committee for helping us meet our mission. Now, I enjoy celebrating teamwork amongst women. I know that teamwork makes the dream work. But I also want to take the time to applaud some individuals as well. 
To fully engage in the membership experience, the league asks that all of our members attend five meetings a year. And of course, this meeting will count as one of them. We have some women who have chosen to go above and beyond the requirements. And they've done that for varying reasons, either because they're being intentional about their growth, but it also may just mean that they are in a season in their life where they have the capacity to do so. We have some members who've gotten as many as 20 meeting credits. Now, is this what I'm asking all of our members to do? No, but I do think that it's important to acknowledge those who have taken the extra step and you'll see their names flashing across your screen. I want to say, bravo, I see you girl, you keep doing your thing. Unfortunately, I'm not able to share every member and committee's great work, but please know that we recognize your incredible service to our members and we are so, so appreciative of your time and your energy that you certainly didn't have to give. But there are two points that I'm trying to highlight this evening. On a journey, we must stop and reflect on our accomplishments. And second, there is always, always an opportunity to celebrate women. We should be clapping, snapping fingers, high-fiving, not just at organizations or committees, but also as individuals. We should affirm each other in our friend circles, pat each other on the back at work, acknowledge our service and our volunteer work. Wherever there are women who are doing great work, we should acknowledge that. And you know what? You do not have to know who the woman is to celebrate her. We can absolutely celebrate women who have broken barriers or made it to leadership roles that were once not available because of gender, race, location, title, etc. which is why we can enthusiastically celebrate that after 244 years of this country's founding, we finally have a woman vice president who also happens to be a woman of color. It is why I can eagerly applaud a woman from Louisiana making it on to the Supreme Court. And I am moved that the first lady of our country, who not only has her doctorate, has chosen to continue teaching while also serving in this role. She definitely won't be the first or last woman who's holding down two jobs. I believe Serena Williams said it best. Every woman's success should be an inspiration to another. We are strongest when we cheer each other on. Look. There is so much more work within the league to recognize. And as you listen to the presentations tonight from your friends here in the league, I trust that you will acknowledge the tremendous work these women have done, that all of us have done. As the Junior League of Baton Rouge continues its goal as the premier women's leadership and development organization in the community. And as Amanda Gorman so eloquently said at the inauguration, for there is always light if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. With that, I would like to invite a bright light of the league, Katie Stewart, to share about our upcoming Women's Leadership Conference. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And I am so very excited to tell you all about our upcoming Women's Leadership Conference. So this year's conference is going to be on March 5th, and we are thrilled that our keynote speaker is the stunningly talented, amazing, history-making ballerina, Misty Copeland. Um, the entire conference this year is going to be held virtually, which has given us the opportunity to reach new people, spread our spread our journeys and invite other women to join in and find their journey with us. Um, so a little bit about Misty, for those of you that may not know, um, Misty began studying ballet at 13. Um, she studied with the San Francisco Ballet School, American Ballet School, went on a full scholarship to the American Ballet Academy, um, joined their core dancer, became the company's second African-American female soloist, and by 2015 was promoted to principal dancer, making her the very first African-American woman to ever become a soloist in the company's 75 year history. She's made her Broadway debuts in um, On the Town and got 
critical acclaim. Um, she's truly groundbreaking and fascinating, and we are so excited to hear some more of her story. Um, we are also incredibly grateful to B1 Bank uh, for coming in as our title sponsor again this year, um, and thrilled to work with them in their goal of reaching more women to talk about financial health and opportunities and provide more insight. We are also really excited. We're going to be working with the Arts Council and local ballet and dance companies to get some young artists introduced to Misty and share some of the amazing art from our city with our uh, virtual attendees. Um, we Tickets are gonna be on sale now, I believe. We can share that link with you shortly and it's gonna be updated on the website later this evening, I think. I will be sending out info soon. Um, general admission tickets are $75. And VIP tickets are also going to be available. Your VIP ticket allows for a smaller virtual session, a little more intimate, some small group time with Misty. Um, so all very exciting things. We are so excited. Um, what else? We are finalizing our breakout sessions. There are gonna be three different tracks you can choose from. And because everything is virtual, um, attendees are going to have the opportunity to pick and choose and really create their own journey for the day. Um, the Women's Leadership Conference is largely targeted for professional women, but what I love about our league is our commitment to various audiences with our fundraisers, which, why I, which is why I'm also super excited for our next speaker, Kristen Owen, who is the chair of Touch a Truck, so she can talk about our more family-centric fundraiser. Kristen? Thank you, Katie. I'm so excited to be here today and share with y'all that the sixth annual Touch a Truck event has been reimagined and we will move through with the drive through event. So please join us on Saturday, April 17th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Our quiet hours are going to be from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. and the event will be at the Breck State Fairgrounds on Airline. Tickets are going to be $30 per vehicle and your ticket is valid for one vehicle with a maximum of eight guests, including the driver. Um, no limousines, no buses, no um, golf carts, no ATVs or trailers will be permitted into the event. Um, your ticket will include access to this year's drive through experience, a scavenger hunt, individually sealed snacks for the kids and more. All tickets must be purchased in advance to reserve your spot. Each ticket will have a scheduled time slot that will be selected during the checkout process. Tickets will be available online soon at uh, www.touchatruckbr.org. Um, we are so proud to host a fun, engaging community event that is safe and socially distant. And so you may be thinking, well, what is the drive through event look like and how is it going to be different from years past. Um, this year, there will be a clear entry point and an exit point. Everyone will enter from one gate and exit from another. From the entry gate, you will embark on a half mile loop around the truck circle and exit by the community zone. Attendees must remain in their cars at all times. No attendees will be allowed to exit their vehicle for the safety of everyone at the event. Another way to support Junior League and Touch a Truck is by purchasing a coloring book for $5, and you can do that now on our website at touchatruckbr.org. And um, I also want to talk about members needing to complete their eight volunteer hours. Y'all will be able to sign up for Touch a Truck shifts beginning in mid-February. Volunteer shifts will include stuffing swag, swag bags, um, helping with setup and takedown, and manning the drink, ice, and snack pack stations, and more. Please know that we're doing everything we can to keep this fun and social distant uh, fundraiser safe for volunteers. Um, please, People wishing to make an additional donation can do so by sponsoring a little trucker. It will send families in our community to TAT that might not otherwise be financially able to attend. More information will be on our website soon. And we hope that you'll join us. Uh, please purchase tickets, uh, share our Facebook post, and invite your friends. Um, I have been on the committee for two years and have had the opportunity to work with really 
phenomenal and smart women in the league. I'm grateful for this opportunity and hope that you will join us with that. I will turn it back over to Narisha. Thank you, Katie and Kristen. Both Tristy and I get the opportunity to work hand in hand with women of both of these committees. The amount of planning and detail that it takes to implement events like this requires many hours of planning. I wanna thank these women and their committee members for the time you've given this year and for your leadership in our first virtual conference and our first drive-through fundraiser. Each year, nominating places 120 women in leadership roles on the board, executive management, nominating committee, and in chair roles for fundraisers, community projects, and in-league placements. Those selected by nominating for incoming board, executive management, and nominating must be voted on by the membership. To share the leadership slate for 2021-2022, I'd like to welcome Mimi Singer-Lee, chair of the nominating committee, to speak. Well, hello, Junior League. I am Mimi Singer Lee, and I am your nominating committee chair this year. It is my absolute honor to present to you the leadership and nominating slate for 2021-2022. Um, I am going to share with you uh, next our um, policies and procedures that talk a little bit about why we uh, present this to our uh, membership. So for our junior league policies and procedures, elected members of the board and executive management should have at least two years of junior league service, proven leadership abilities, and shall meet the requirements for eligibility to serve as officers of the league as outlined in the bylaws. Members currently on probationary status are not eligible to be slated for board or executive management positions for the following year. League and other volunteer experience, as well as educational and professional training shall be considered for each specific position. Each candidate shall be a member in good standing, have an understanding of league policies, procedures, and operations in her designated area of leadership. The nominating committee shall slate candidates with a diversity of experience, and no more than two-thirds of the board or executive management may have served on the board or executive management in the last three years. Okay, so now that we got the, the um, procedures out of the way, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the slate of candidates. Next. So for president for 2021-2022, we have Tristy Charpentier. Next. For president-elect, we have Jessica O'Connor, who sits on both board of directors and executive management. Next. And we have our board of directors. So we have Ashley Connolly as the chief financial officer. Jessica Gwen Johnson as long-range planning chair. Robin Porter for director at large. Grace Weber for the director at large, Monique Scott Spaulding as our recording secretary, Caroline Tomini Monteverde for the policy governance, Amy Fennell for chief of staff, and Megan Cardero as our presidential appointment. This is our slate of board of directors. Next. For our executive management, we'll start with Brandy Simmons as our annual planning chair, Sarah Schnauder as the community vice president, Chris Lynn Mayer as fund development vice president, Chris Beatty as financial vice president, Jasmine Newsom as our presidential appointment, Aaron Fulbright as marketing communications vice president, Adrian Owen Jones as training and organizational development vice president, and Liz Santani as our membership development vice president. In addition to the board and executive management, we have our uh, nominating committee members. And next year, our nominating chair will be Katie Schaber. Laura Mary will serve as our assistant chair. Caitlin Boyd as our committee member. Rhonda McMillan, Karen Bro, Kiana Patan, Allison Reeves, and Diamond Sherrod as committee members. All right, no, oh, no, not next yet, I'm sorry. And uh, so this is our slate for our executive management, our board of directors, and our nominating committee. 
Um, we also are going to be voting as a membership on um, our current league year for one position that we are filling as fund development vice president. So this happened due to a vacancy in the fund development vice president position. So we have slated Crystal and Miller Mayer for the remainder of this 2020-2021 league year to serve as the fund development vice president. So you will also have that on your membership page to vote. I would like to just take a moment and thank our current nominating committee for their work in helping to put it together this phenomenal slate. And that's Caitlin Boyd, Carrie Parks Knight, Katie Schaber, Laura Mary, Nikki Godfrey, Megan Cardero, Rhonda McMillan, and our sustaining advisor, Elise Greer. So please remember that we need you to vote, um, that you accept the proposed leadership slate, and for Crystal and Mayer to fulfill the fund development VP for the remainder of the 2020-2021 league year. You can do so on your member homepage. This is not the only item that you vote on at this time of the year. Of equal importance is voting to accept the community projects and the work that we will do in the Baton Rouge community. I would like to welcome Kendra Hendricks and Deidre Roberts to share this year's community slate. Good evening, I am Kendra Hendricks. Good evening, everyone. I'm Deidre Douglas Robert. We're here to present to you the 2021-2022 Community Slate. Next slide. First, let's discuss our values. First, our membership embraces commitment and acts with integrity to do what is right. We embrace commitment. We go the extra mile. We honor our commitments. We're efficient, effective, and organized. Act with integrity. We are professional, we are trustworthy, we are dependable. Two, our community deserves compassionate service and thoughtful collaboration. Compassionate service. We are caring, we are approachable, we are open. Thoughtful collaboration. We are strategic, we are purposeful, we are smart. Three, our culture fosters strategic training and innovative leadership. Strategic training. We are willing to ask why. We are willing to ask how. We want to make ourselves better. Innovative leadership. We are open to growth. We are willing to take risk. We are courageous. Next slide. So here are our 2021-2022 community projects. First, we have Diaper Bank with a budget of $50,000, 25 volunteers, and partnerships that include Diaper Bank Network, Girl Scouts of America, St. Joseph's Academy, Business First Bank, and Iberia Bank. Next, Painted Playground with a budget of $20,000, 25 volunteers, and partnership with East Baton Rouge Parish Schools, Elementary and Middle. Next, we have Storytime in the Garden with a budget of $5,500. 25 volunteers, and our partnership is with the LSU Agricultural Center Botanical Gardens and Our Lady of the Lake Children's Hospital. Next, we have Ready Hands with a budget of $500, 20 volunteers, and this partnership includes organizations in the veterans community. Next. Now on this slide, these projects that are highlighted are a part of the donation fulfillment contract of the naming of the Junior League of Baton Rouge Family Resource Center. And so they're not a part of the membership vote. And they include patient activity days and the Junior League of Baton Rouge Resource Center, both with a budget of 7,500 and both with 40 volunteers each. Next. So how can we fulfill our obligation to the league? and to our community. We have various ways to do that. Mornings, afternoons, evenings, weekends, or you can schedule them on your own time. Next. Let's get a deeper dive into diaper bank. So members host diaper drives in the community to collect supplies in addition to packing diaper bundles. And in those bundles, they include tips and information about the early nutrition benefits of breastfeeding for women's hospital. These packs are distributed to members of the community who would otherwise not have access to clean diapers. As Narisha mentioned earlier, we also looked at competencies that will be gained from working with this 
particular project. And they include community partnerships, issue education and organi organizing, cultural competency, effective use of resources, managing logistics, relationship building and networking, teamwork and team building. This placement is self-scheduled. The vision that we will further in this project is health and education. The impact, since 2017, over 1 million diapers have been distributed, which have reached between 3,000 and 4,000 children and their families. And of course, with COVID-19, we have implemented social distancing guidelines. The, the shifts are limited and PPE is enforced. Also, this activity requires physical movement, lifting, bending, and stooping. Next, painted playgrounds. Painted playground project is designed to help schools with limited or no playground equipment. So our members will work to design, schedule, and paint playgrounds across the city, elementary schools, and some middle schools. Play kits are packaged with instructions for students and teachers to give area children a fun opportunity to get active. Healthy food inserts are also given with instructions on creating balanced meals. In this placement, you will learn community partnerships, active listening, advancing diversity and inclusion, community insight, effective use of resources, project management, teamwork, and team building. This placement is in the evenings and weekends. It furthers our vision of health, cultural development, and education. The impact is 20,000 to 30,000 children in the Baton Rouge area. Social distancing guidelines outside and PPE required. This activity also requires physical movement, lifting, bending, and stooping. Story time in the garden. So story time in the garden focuses on early childhood literacy. And so our members will work hands on with kids to teach them about healthy eating in a creative manner. This placement also combines reading to kids and participating in making healthy snacks that correlate to the story. Competencies gained, community partnerships, crafting key messages, advancing diversity and inclusion, cultural competency, and presentation skills. This placement is weekends and evenings. This project furthers our vision of education and cultural development. The impact, 500 to 600 kids from in-league and community projects. Social distancing guidelines followed, virtual videos, and at-home activity bag compilations. Next. Ready Hands. The Ready Hands project allows members to accomplish short-term commitment projects in the community. Members will partner with community activities to accomplish small projects that assist in improving the well-being of Baton Rouge. So what can you gain from this particular placement? Community partnerships, community convening, direct service, advancing diversity and inclusion, and managing logistics. The time of placement, mainly evenings and weekends, and it's somewhat flexible. The vision, health, education, and cultural development. The impact, tens of thousands of community members each year. And social distancing guidelines, outside events, and other approved events with PPE. Next. Patient Activity Days. So Patient Activity Days supports the, the needs of Our Lady of the Lake Children's Hospital. We provide emotional support, therapeutic play, and developmentally appropriate activities. And so our members will work on multiple projects, such as distributing items from the comfort cart and distributing information. The competencies gained include community partnerships, direct service, relationship building, crafting key messages, presentation skills, managing logistics, and public speaking. This placement is evenings and weekends. 
It furthers our vision of health and education. The impact, 1,700 hospitalized children and their siblings and parents. Social distancing guidelines, limited members allowed per shift with PPE. Next. The Junior League of Baton Rouge's Family Resource Center, and it's located in Our Lady of the Lake Children's Hospital. The center provides families with information, resources, and help for their medical questions. The center also has classroom space, a business center, and meeting space for small groups. What can you gain from this particular placement? Community partnerships, direct service, relationship building, key messages, presentation skills, managing logistics, and public speaking. This placement is mainly evenings and weekends and flexible. The vision that's further is health and education. The impact, again, 1,700 hospitalized children and the social distancing guidelines Limited members allowed per shift with PPE. Next. So how do we vote for the slate? Be sure to visit your member homepage at members.juniorleague.org. And so selection of the community slate is done by research from members on the R&D committee, discussion, refinement, and vote by community council, executive management and board before being brought to you, our membership. Members, we ask that you please vote yes on the acceptance of this community slate. Thank you. Narisha. Thank you to the community chairs who provided their feedback on what we could do to improve each of our community projects. The community slate is one of many areas where we ask members to provide input. Another area where we have sought input from lead constituents is the, strategic, is the strategic plan. Before I invite Adrian to speak, I want to share some general words about strategic planning. For a nonprofit organization to grow in membership, in revenue, in impact, in presence requires intentionality. That intentionality is rooted in a broader vision for the organization and not just one individual leader's vision from year to year. If you speak to other organizations or members of the community, there are many areas where the Junior League excels. And there are also some areas for improvement. While the pandemic forced us to reimagine some of the work we are doing, we cannot wait for external factors, but rather it is imperative for us to be proactive and thoughtful about the work. This is why I invested some of our league human and financial capital in developing a five-year strategic plan. My sincerest hope is that you will own your membership journey and identify where you can be invested in the elevation of our league over the next few years. And as Adrian Owen Jones, Long Range Planning Chair prepares to speak, I would like to thank her and her team for their incredible work on what was an incredibly aggressive timeline. Adrian. Thank you, Narisha, for that generous introduction. So like Narisha said, I'm Adrienne Owen-Jones, and I've had the honor of leading the strategic planning effort this year. And I want to first start by thanking my strategic planning committee members. Um, this work would not be possible without uh, their dedication and commitment. It's been a real labor of love the past few months, and um, I wouldn't be here without their support. I'm truly grateful. Um, so why did we embark on developing a strategic plan in the first place? Like Narisha said, we did it because we wanted to build on our organization for the future. We saw this as an opportunity to both dream big and to address um, some opportunities that we've never really been able to gain traction on in a single league year. As a board, it is our responsibility to assess risks and opportunities and to think long-term about the organization. You know, we truly believe that the day-to-day -day management of the league, which is where I think the real magic happens, is at the executive management and committee level. And so for that reason, you will see that this plan is not overly prescriptive. We view this as a roadmap for where we believe the league should go but exactly how we get there is for each president and president-elect to work through each year. 
So how do we get to the recommendations that I'm about to present to you? Um, we started by surveying a diverse and representative group of league members. This included new members, members earlier in their league career, members late in their league career, new sustainers, sustainers that have been supporting this organization for decades. We talked to past presidents and members who's left the league. We even talked to prospective members to understand why they didn't join. We worked to ensure that each survey segment and focus group did um, was diverse in age, life stage, race, occupation, and even marital status. And we did our best to, to ensure that we're receiving feedback that was representative of the league experience for each of you. All in all, we talked to hundreds of women and um, read through more than 1,000 responses in depth. So what you should expect to see in this plan is some connection to your voice, even if you are not directly surveyed. And what we can promise you is that you will all have the opportunity to engage with this plan going forward. Um, next slide, please, Rob. So in this plan, we really prioritize the member experience. Um, throughout uh, this plan. And as part of that, I felt it was important to maintain consistent communication um, and gather feedback to our members throughout the process. Um, we believe that transparency is good for our league and we wanna make sure that you all understand the thought process and facts that went into building this plan. We could make any recommendations that we wanted. We could build a wild, ambitious, off the wall plan, but it would be just that, a plan. Um, for us, to, for this to be more than a plan, for it to be successful and for our goals to be met, it's going to take you. You are essential for us building a stronger league by 2027. Finally, you know, I'm sharing this because we wanna make sure we are modeling ourselves after the behaviors we recommend in this plan. We're holding ourselves accountable to you as members to see, that, um, to see this plan through to completion. So with that, I'm going to quickly walk you through each of the, these goals. I won't have time to go through them in depth, but I do wanna tell you about two upcoming opportunities for you to ask questions and learn about them more. And I'll share that information in detail at the end of this meeting. Um, so that was actually the last slide, but now on this slide, um, goal one, we wanted to reinvent the member experience. So based on our feedback and conversations with you, we identified a need to evolve as a league and implement a commitment model that speaks to diverse needs of our membership. Nine years is a long time and many members engage as sustainers beyond that. Life shifts happen. One member shared a story starting with her league career single and carefree. She's now married, a mother and a small business owner. Her concerns are very different. Another league member shared that she started her league career all in and she was invested in um, volunteering with all of her free time until an opportunity presented itself in her career and she had to pull back her commitment to the league. These examples paint a picture of women who want to be engaged in a way that is best for them in those differing periods of life. We're looking at several ways we can do that better. We also notice an interesting opportunity in our feedback. Satisfaction among late league members was much higher than early career league members. Digging in, it's not surprising that this came down to relationships. So whether um, this is the reason that you joined or the reason that you stayed, forging strong bonds um, with other women is an important part of feeling satisfied as a member. So for this reason, we're looking for ways to be more intentional in the way that we form connections early and sustain that throughout your membership. You can go to the next slide, which should say goal two. Great, we're on track. Goal two, simplifying our systems and communication. You know, we heard you loud and clear, there's too much red tape. Um, but beyond that, what we heard is that systems, the systems we have in place, which are there to create consistency and integrity, are not providing an equitable experience for all members. For example, have you all heard about these binders that Holidays gets when they step into a new role? Um, I personally would love that. I have gotten less than a sheet of paper, um, but wouldn't it be great if every league member started their year knowing um, exactly what they were doing and how to be successful doing it? That's the essence of this goal. We really saw this as a way for each um, to, to build on the member experience and make it stronger. You know, while our systems and structures are necessary, they need to evolve. So we look forward to you using your voice and your agency in this process. And um, 
you know, we've got some really exciting initiatives here from building a pipeline of capable and invested leaders to improving on our systems and technology. Overall, I see this as a real investment in giving our members the experience that they deserve. Next slide, which hopefully says goal three. Okay, great. Um, goal three, enhancing the impact of our community investments by aligning our philanthropy, volunteerism, and advocacy with our mission and vision. What we heard from both members within the league and the community is that while everyone knows the league is a volunteering organization, it isn't perceived as a strategic investor focused on community impact. So what you'll see on this slide is that we want to shift that narrative and ensure that we are holding ourselves accountable to making positive change in our community. So what we are recommending is better aligning our investments. And what I mean by that is dollars, volunteer hours, and our voice to be as impactful as possible. We've made great progress in this area, so we want to lean into it. We want to make sure we are effectively measuring and reporting out on these strategic investments. Next slide. Um, goal four, increase opportunities for our brand to grow influence and visibility with, within our membership and throughout the community. So I'm going to use a curse word here, but we are an organization of badass pioneering women, right? And um, just like we discussed, we've made tremendous impact in our community. And what we found is that our members know this, but the community at large is not as aware. So did, you know, uh, through this process, I learned that um, so many nonprofits were, were um, in Baton Rouge were founded by the league. So for example, seed funding for WRKF, our local radio station, um, was provided by the Junior League of Baton Rouge. Um, the Arts Council started as a community project within the league. There's so many more examples from the Emerge Center to Knock Knock that would not be here without women in the league. So beyond that community impact, we also have pioneering women. Everyone in Baton Rouge knows names like Donna Siraj and Rose Hudson and the wonderful Yolanda Dixon who served on our um, committee with us. People know about their impressive careers and their contributions, but few people know that they are long sustaining members of the league. We see a need to fix this and we don't see this as a frivolous investment. Elevating our brand as women, as catalyst for lasting community change will help us raise more money from our fundraisers, help us enhance our advocacy efforts and build stronger partnerships in the community and will help us recruit and retain a stronger membership. We also just believe that our members deserve to be proud of who they are as the Junior League of Baton Rouge. Next slide. Finally, we see the need to build a dynamic and resilient fundraising model to respond to emerging needs and, um, through diverse and transparent revenue streams. So this might sound like the most boring slide, but if the past few years have taught us anything, it's that, a that we are a resilient group of women. But between the floods of 2016 and the pandemic of the last year, we've seen our budgets take a hit. This is in part of our reliance on physical fundraisers, but it's also a recognition that membership is a luxury and it's difficult at times to justify joining a, nor nor um, a new organization when things are hard. So we really saw this as an opportunity for us to enhance the membership experience by providing more consistent engagement activities year after year through a more sustainable budget. To do this, we need to do a few things. One, we need to diversify our revenue stream so that no one year is flush with funds while another is forced to make cuts that would never negatively impact our programs and partnerships. Two, we really need to maximize our current fundraisers and make sure that we're as efficient and effective as possible. Three, we need to revise our policies and procedures to allow us to be more nimble and responsive um, to emerging needs within both our membership and the community. For example, in 2016, we wanted to provide scholarships to members whose homes have flooded. Even though we have multiple sources to pull those funds from, um, it was difficult for us to do it quickly and efficiently. So for us to be dynamic and relevant, um, we need to make sure that our budget is flexible enough to meet these emerging needs. Um, next slide. Awesome. Finally, uh, I want to make it clear that each of these goals has been evaluated on its own ability to further our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. We didn't think this should be its own goal because we believe these initiatives should be infused within the entire plan and part of the standing standard operating of the league. Um, from ensuring that every member has a true sense of belonging to evaluating access to leadership 
to diversifying our partnerships, we want to make sure that you know we are committed to holding ourselves accountable in these areas, and we will um, have measurable metrics and report out on our success against those. Next slide. Um, so <laughs> thank you. That's the plan. I appreciate you all listening. Uh, like I said, we have two Q&A sessions, one later this week and one next week, and you'll find information about that on your member homepage. I encourage you to sign up. For those who are registered by tomorrow morning, you will receive a survey to ask questions in advance. That way you can have the opportunity to make your voice heard. We'll record the session so you can watch later even if you can't attend. Thank you so much. Um, the strategic plan is not the only investment that the league has made this year. And so next up, River Road Recipes has been working with a marketing consultant in the food and beverage space and has an exciting update to share with you. I hope you all will enjoy the history. Um, the sustainer Cheryl Payne will provide in a forward and look forward guided by Chair Corito Mata. Thanks, Adrian, And ladies, I'm so excited to be here. My name is Cheryl Payne, and I was River Road Recipes Chair about 10 years ago. So it's been a long time since I've been to a general membership meeting, but it's just really exciting to be here. And this has just been so impressive. Um, you ladies have done so well. So um, let's go ahead and get started talking about something that I love, which is the history of River Road Recipes. Next slide. So you all know about these four wonderful cookbooks, but really to get started talking about our history, we have to go back further to our first cookbook. Next slide. Which was called Bon Appetit. And this was published from 1945 to 1955. And it really wasn't that big of a success. It was a hard cookbook to follow. It was very ambiguous. And so after 10 years, the league decided to put it on the shelf. And, um, other fundraisers were performed. We had some style shows, some other things. Next slide. So then they decided they really wanted to think about doing a cookbook again. So they formed an investigative committee and really talked about, do we want to do this? This was in 1957. But you know, the times were different then. And our financial advisors, who were all men, discouraged us. And they said, y'all can't do this. And our women of the league decided to, to go against that advice. And they debated it, they voted on it, and they decided that another cookbook was definitely the way to go. And thank goodness they did, because 60 years plus, this cookbook is still the number one community cookbook of all time. Next slide. So of course, now we had to start working on getting the cookbook together. And because it's a junior league, of course, they held a naming contest for the cookbook. And lots of submissions um, came in. And the one that ultimately won was submitted by Ann Arbor. And she named the cookbook River Road Recipes. And she was inspired by all the recipes that came from individuals living up and down the River Road in Baton Rouge. So when you think about our cookbook, really think about that River Road and the history of the food up and down the river road. Um, recipes were gathered and they started typing them up, you know, manual typing and with uh, the, the carbon paper so they can make multiple copies. You know, there was no computers back then. And then they started testing them on their families and really getting the recipes correct. Um, and so after a long time, a couple of years, they were able to publish the cookbook in October of 1959 and boy, was it a hit because just in five months, 10,000 copies were sold. And to put that in today's perspective, it takes us about two years to go through 10,000 copies of a cookbook. Um, but it, it just goes to show you how popular that cookbook was and how really ingenious these women were trying to sell the cookbook. They would fill the cookbooks um, fill a suitcase up with cookbooks and take it on vacation with them and sell it to whoever they could get. Um, and also remember that when these cookbooks were first published, the price of the cookbook was $3. So earning $17,000 of profit immediately was a huge deal. And it's just amazing because it, it is still our number one cookbook. Next slide. I thought it would be fun to show y'all some of our original committee members. 
the um, photo um, on the left with um, the blonde and me, and that's Miss Emily Robinson. She was our original chair. And um, Holly, Emily, and I were at um, Holly Days selling cookbooks, and Miss Robinson sat and signed cookbooks like she was a rock star. And she told a lot of fantastic stories. And she also told us that years later, one of those financial advisors came back and said, yeah, we really missed the boat. And she said, yep, we showed y'all. Um, the other two photos are some of our original committee members at our 50th anniversary um, luncheon. And sadly, we've lost, I think, all of the, these ladies, and including two of them last year. And, and the author of our most famous recipe, Spinach Madeline. Next slide. So this is Spinach Madeline on the left, and she's getting her 50th anniversary copy of the cookbook at the luncheon from Julie Jones, who was our um, anniversary chair. And she created Spinach Madeline, and she was a young wife. She had a, a bridge party, and she needed to serve luncheon. And so she had a cream spinach recipe a jalapeno cheese roll in the freezer and some spices. And she thought it would be fun to, to jazz up her cream spinach and everybody loved it. And then she had a supper club with her um, husband and their friends and all the men loved it too. So of course she, um, she had to submit this to the cookbook and um, she named it kind of tongue in cheek spinach Madeline using the French spelling because she was familiar with a recipe called veal Madeline. And it has literally become the most popular recipe of any of our cookbooks and has made it on several lists of um, best recipes of the century. And when she passed away in the fall of 2020 in her obituary, it said she was a past president of the Junior League of Baton Rouge and the author of the Spinach Madeline recipe. So um, it's just amazing. And she was fun to talk to as well. Next slide. So of course, because this was so successful, the league decided about 20 years later to, um, to have a second helping, a second cookbook. And again, this was, um, it was all still triple tested recipes, but because it was in 1976, there was a lot of convenience items on the shelves in the grocery stores, and you'll see that incorporated into the cookbook. Um, there's a lot of great recipes in here. These are all different from our first edition. And if you haven't tried the potato chip cookies, I would highly recommend them. They're shockingly good and, and something that you would never even think to, um, to make, but I love them. Um, and there's so many good recipes in this cookbook as well. Next slide. All right, so number three is our healthy collection. And this was in 1994. And so in the 90s, healthy and low fat cooking all became a trend. And so the junior league decided to put out their own version of that. We were the, one of the first junior leagues to do so. And all of the recipes were um, analyzed, dietitian looked at them, and they were all modified to have a lower fat content in them. And there, something very different in this cookbook is that all the nutritional analysis is included in the cookbook. And you'll notice that the, the cover is green. Originally, it was not always green, and it did not have the traditional lettering. It was a, the original cover was very, very different. In a couple of years, we uh, reimagined the, um, the cover, um, so it would, would blend in better with the other, the first two cookbooks, um, and even some of the artwork inside, all of that was uh, uh, updated as well, and the artist donated all of her time and her sketches. Um, next slide. All right, so that come, that leads us to our last cookbook, our um, River Road Rel Welcomes number four, Warm Welcomes. And it is very, very different than our other cookbooks. It's an entertaining cookbook and it shows how people in Baton Rouge live and entertain and it's color and a coffee table cookbook. And you all know this, right? Because I think you probably all have it. Um, and then, you know, women at that time, they didn't have as much time to flip through their cookbooks to determine if they were gonna have a dinner party, what they were gonna serve. Instead, they could just open up this cookbook. Um, there's so many fun recipes in this one as well. Um, one of my favorites is great salsa. And if you're going to a Mardi Gras parade, of course, in any other year, um, it's such a wonderful addition to um, 
to a parade party because it doesn't spoil. So I highly recommend that one. Um, and something I want y'all to, to kind of look, to, to think about when you look at the cookbooks, when the, the first two cookbooks were published, women were known by their husband's names, um, not their own names. So by the third cookbook, they suddenly were Mrs. Cheryl Payne. And then by the fourth cookbook, it really wasn't as important anymore to, um, to get that individual recognition. So it's just a little bit of change um, of, of how everything happened in society. Next slide. So River Road Recipes, I consider it to be such the roots of our Junior League of Baton Rouge. Um, the funds that have been brought in, we have, we have brought in over $5 million and given back to the community. And there's been so many of our wonderful organizations in Baton Rouge that were original Junior League um, projects that were funded by River Road Recipes dollars. Um, and specifically, I bring up to the Speech and Hearing Foundation, which is now Emerge, and LESC, which is now LESM. Those were in the early 60s, and, and those definitely the, the money from River Road Recipes really um, were, were able to fund those projects and many, many more. John Fulce, um, has often said that River Road Recipes was his first instructor. And there's been so many other people that say that as well. Next slide. So nationally, we've also won a lot of different awards. Um, we have, we've won publisher awards. We have had a lot of recognition um, from Southern Living, Southern Lady, People Magazine, um, Food Network. Um, you know, we've had Kristen Landry, who is a former um, committee chair, she was um, on Food Network with Bobby Flay making spinach madeleine. Flex by using the processed cheese and the, the, Vel the Velveeta and the cheese roll, um, but he loved it. And then um, Miss Donna Siraj was on the Gary Collins show in LA years ago as well. So um, everybody across the country really does know what River Road Recipes is. and it is still the number one um, community cookbook of all time. We're not the oldest junior league cookbook, but we definitely are the most successful. And one of the, the best quotes, one of the funnest quotes is from New York Times. And they said, if there were community cookbook Academy Awards, the Oscar for breast performance would hands down go to River Road Recipes. And I definitely agree with that. Next slide. So there are so many fun stories about River Road Recipes and so much wonderful history that five minutes doesn't do it justice. Um, I'm going to recommend that you read your cookbooks because especially number three, there is league history and River Road Recipe history embedded in each of the pages and lots of funny quotes and, and fun stories uh, about how the women you know, peddled the, um, the cookbooks, and like I said, um, putting them in their suitcase when they went on vacation, um, giving them to our, our presidents. Um, so if you want more, definitely read your cookbooks, find a sustainer. We love talking about the history of River Road recipes. And if you've never gone to the Goodwood Library, take a, go to the Goodwood Library and look to see some of the league history um, that's on collection there and the River Road Recipe collection as well. It's really fantastic. Um, so I've told you a lot about our past and our wonderful current committee chair, Harita Mato, is going to show tell you about our present and some exciting plans for the future. So I am going to turn it over to Carita. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Hi, ladies. I'm Carito Gialagomata, current chair for River Road Recipes. Um, oh, Rob, you can go to the next slide, by the way. Um, speaking with Cheryl, Catherine Harrell, our sustaining advisor, Ms. Donna Siraj, past chairs, and those who are responsible for the strength of this fundraiser and learning from them this year has been invaluable. Um, I learned the value of this committee and the rich history that it has. 
I learned that we became so great because of the greatness of the women before us. And that the beauty of these old books is that they're still so relevant today. Even during a time of decline in national cookbook sales, River Road Recipes is held firm. The food, the most important part of all of this is still very relevant. The community is still relevant and the community loves it. Even without a structured formal marketing plan, we held. But we realize that we don't just want to hold, we wanna thrive. The league looks different today than 1959. How do we stay relevant in more progressive times? Even more so, how do we get better? And it's with the confidence and investment of our board, sustainers, and the league as a whole that we've hired, engaged, and began work with an outside marketing firm to help take us to the next level. You can move to the next slide, please. A few months ago, we began working with Mesh Marketing Firm. They beat out a number of other local firms with their vision and dynamic strategies. They told us that not only do they firmly believe that River Road Recipes is still a sustainable and viable fundraiser, but that we have the capability to reach heights that we've never had before. They're the people behind many campaigns that you might recognize, and we felt that their commitment to the league and our vision was incomparable. So we're so looking forward to our partnership with them. Next slide, please. So that leaves us with a game plan. One, we increase sales nationally and locally and get ourselves back into those niche shops and tables who crave our food. Two, we, we reinvigorate our presence in our community with new events. Our food should be shared and shared often. So be on the lookout for those events once we're able to do them again. And lastly, and probably most importantly, we ask that you invest in us. Join our committee. We're not just recipes and photos. We're, more than, we're simply more than spinach madeleine and a $30 obligation in the spring. Do you wanna plan events? Do you wanna make videos or be on TV? Would you like to work on accounting, bookkeeping or publishing? There's a spectrum of talents needed. And we are and always have been a small business that supports the league. The reason why River Road Recipes was so successful was because our members believed in it and bought into it. On a more personal note, I joined this committee last year because I'm a trained chef. This had to do with food and it made sense. It made the most sense of any of the other placements. I stayed on because I fell in love with River Road Recipes. I fell in love with our rich past that our entire league stands upon. I fell in love with our bright future that radiates with potential. And I fell in love with the work right now that we must do to get us there. And we can't do it without you all. Serving on this committee is an honor and I'm so proud to be on it. So if you feel inclined or you're curious, join us. In short, the future is bright for River Road. We're currently looking for women who wanna use their skills to take advantage of this great opportunity before us. I hope that you'll consider joining the committee. Thank you, Narisha, and the board of directors for your support, investment, leadership, and guidance in our work this year. I'll turn it back over to Narisha for closing announcements. I just wanna say again to our members, thank you, thank you, thank you for all the incredible work that you have done this year. I can't tell you how much joy it is to serve as a leader of the organization and work hand in hand with you. Please know that anytime any of you need anything from me, that I am accessible. Um, I also want to share, um, I mentioned this earlier in my welcome comments, that if there are challenges that any of you are experiencing, because the year can't be perfect for all of us, if you, any of you are experiencing any challenges that are impacting your league year, please reach out to Jessica Gwen Johnson, our membership VP, talk through whatever your particular situation is. We want to make sure that you know that we are here for you. If you have not done so, please include your name in the chat function so that you can receive meeting credit for attendance. This is also a reminder, even though we're all very familiar with this, that there is an upcoming deadline of membership dues, which are $135, and your River Road recipes, the $30 cookbook purchase. You can either purchase our current cookbooks or um, cookbooks that we have received from other leagues, and all of that is due on March 15th. 
Our members have done incredibly well at adhering to the COVID-19 guidelines that we have provided for our league. We still remain in, um, in phase two. And if you're unfamiliar about what it is that you are able to engage or not engage in, please know that our COVID guidelines are available on the resource tab um, on our website. And finally, I look forward to seeing each of you at the Women's Leadership Conference and also at Touch a Truck this year, both promise to be a incredibly fun and rewarding experience. I do want to leave you with these closing words. The road to success is not always straight and easy. There will be turns of defeat, potholes of depression, rocks and stole stones of personal problems in your way. But believe it, when you finally scale the path and reach its end, the smile on your face is one which you will never forget. I look forward to seeing all of your smiling faces at the end of the lead journey. Thank you and enjoy your evening. The meeting is adjourned.